You know, when, when, when I was talking to Pastor Jeff and the leadership and trying to really understand what's going on in Orlando, I really began to pray into and pray with Pastor Jeff and, and um, really asked for God to give us a, something that would encourage each of us in our respective cities and our respective lives. And so if you have your Bibles, I ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to be reading from, um, starting in verse 35. When you get there, just say amen or hold up your Bible. Amen. Okay. Amen. All right. My son tried to convince me to start the preaching out by, by I love Billy Graham, and uh, he asked me to like, Open your Bibles to chapter 9 of Matthew. And I was like, no, I can't do that, but now I'm going to get to tell them that it did. <laughs> okay, so starting in verse 35, I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Now, I want to add another scriptural reading. We're going to go over to Haggai. Now, Haggai is the third to last uh, or second to last book of the Old Testament. So you have Malachi, Zephaniah, and Haggai is just before that. And while you're turning there, I'm just going to kind of set up a little context of what was going on in that time. So, so basically when, when, when Haggai, before Haggai was sent in, um, pretty much starting even prior to, but really finding its advent again in the time of Solomon, the the northern and southern kingdoms of, uh, well, there was no northern and southern kingdom, but, but the nation of Israel was practicing idolatry. Um, Solomon had so many wives and so many concubines, and, and they were turning his heart away from God, and, and, and the, the pureness and the holiness and the purity of the worship of the Jewish God, Yahweh, was being, was being compromised as, uh, as Solomon was setting up altars for his wives and concubines of false gods and, and idolatrous gods. And as a result of that, it infiltrated and permeated throughout the whole nation. And, and eventually, um, it really grabbed a hold of a lot of people. Now, God sent some reformers in to reform some of it, but God would send prophets in, and they would, they would warn the people that if they would continue to go in the direction that they were going, that he was not going to bear with it, but was going to have to do something about it. And uh, unfortunately, as we know how it goes, uh, they, they did not heed the warnings when he warned them. And eventually, God would use other nations to, to conquer, after the split, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. But God, um, God made a promise during those times of the prophets where, where Jeremiah gave a, gave, was given a word that after 70 years of an exile to Babylon, the, the Judah kingdom would return to Jerusalem and they would, they would be back there. And so over the course of time, God sent the exiles of Babylon back with a charge to go and to begin work on rebuilding the temple uh, that was at that point destroyed. And, and so they were sent back with the charge and they were also given sovereign authority and, and favor by Cyrus, who was at that time would basically be the king of the world. And, and so he sent them back with the charges, provisions, everything that they needed to go back and to begin the work. And they began the work. And they were joyful when you read through it and the excitement, the joy, the tears, the praises of the people coming back and laying the foundation for the temple. And they started with the work, but then they relaxed on the work. And when they relaxed on the work, about 16 years into that work, the temple was not completed 
And according to God's timeline and the way that the scriptures seem to indicate it, is that the temple should have been completed by that time. And so God sends Haggai on the scene. And he sends them in to really just kind of stir the pot and, and to begin to, to speak into their lives and begin to encourage them in, in taking up the work again. And so let's read from chapter 1, starting in verse 1. It says, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. So they're basically saying, eh, you know, it's going to happen, but, you know, it's not right now. And then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses in this temple to lie in ruins. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much, but you bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put them in bags with holes. Anybody ever felt like that? This guy. Um, but thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it. And be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Oh, man, when God says why, I'm like definitely leaning in there. I want to know why. Well, why? Because of my house that is in ruins. With every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine, and the oil, and on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and in all the labor of your hands. Now, that might sound kind of harsh, but I think C.S. Lewis said, God speaks to us in our comfort, but shouts in our pain. I think, I might be paraphrasing, I might not have it completely right. But, you know, I've been in a lot of situations in my life where, in my pain, God is, like, really talking loud, and he's really got my attention big time. And I think he was obviously using these. He was withholding blessing that he, that he wanted to pour out on his people, but he was withholding it so that they would begin to turn. Maybe after they had tried their own ways and gone in their own strength to do whatever, whatever it was that they were trying to do or purpose in their hearts to do, but then it kept on hitting a wall, kept on not really really hitting a stride or getting the traction like they had hoped for. So eventually, maybe after trying that, they might turn to God and say, okay, we're listening now. We're willing to hear what we need to be doing so that, the, so that, so that, so that maybe blessing will come forth. Maybe the crops that we need will, 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 will come. Maybe that ro new roof that I need would, 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 would uh, get built. You know, whatever the need was at that time. And so... What do these accounts have to do with each other? You know, before Jesus ascended, he said to his disciples in Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe that which I commanded you. And lo, behold, I am with you even to the end of the age. And, you know, 2,000 years after that, there's a church that, that meets in a building on 1919 Delaney Street. And from the website that I read, it says that Delaney Baptist um, mission is it exists to glorify God by making fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ in the greater Orlando area. And I commend this church for that because that really ought to be the, 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 the mission of every church at its core because that was, the, that was the thing that Jesus told us to go and to do. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of things that churches are doing that are amazing. There are different aspects of ministry, but at the core of it all, that component ought to be its, 
its hinge. It ought to be its foundation. And everything that we leverage and every resource that we have and everything we do should be leveraging that mission. And so I believe that this church here, that your, con- your congregation in this building, it is, a, it, is a, it is a sovereign and divinely positioned church. And every church really is. is divinely appointed to be in a specific neighborhood, in a specific marketplace, in a specific area to reach those that are, that are not yet fully devoted disciples of Jesus. But our desire and our prayer and our purpose is to make fully devoted disciples of Jesus to the glory of him. Amen? And so I want to be careful as I'm sharing with you guys that this is not a rebuke to Delaney Baptist Church. I would, I would fear coming up here and, and rebuking people I don't know. And I, would, I don't feel that like that is the way of the Lord right now. For me, in my life, it is, it is an encouragement to us and a challenge to us and a reminder. You know, I want to be Haggai to myself. And I pray that the word of God this morning as we're reading it, the word of God will be, as it were, Haggai to your heart, stir you up. Because um, I think that we need to be reminded because we all have a proclivity and an inclination like the, like the, the people of uh, they were they were rebuilding the temple in that time to relax in the work. I'm guilty of it. I've been for a while, and this preparing for this was such a blessing to me because I was reminded of the intentionality that I ought to have even more if I really believe what the scriptures say about judgment. If I really believe what the scriptures say about eternity, then man, I ought not to be able to live with myself if I haven't at least tried to do something. Maybe not everything, but I can surely do something. Amen? And so, as I was praying, I was asking the Lord, and saying, well, what, 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 what do we need then as a church to really start with? And he led me right back to Matthew 9, where, and he's opened my heart to see that he's given a model right then and there in those, in those few verses that we read in Matthew 9. And, and when he says that, you know, he looked out upon the masses and he was moved with compassion. Compassion is different than sympathy. Sympathy kind of like relates in some way or empathy, but compassion has an action component to it. And so Jesus was driven beyond sympathy, beyond empathy, and was moved to compassion. So he acted and he healed the masses and he ministered to the masses. And so what the church needs and what I need is, is, is a eyes full of compassion that lead me to action each and every day. And that's a little, I, you know, I rhyme that intentionally, just so you know, so you would remember it, okay? So let's, let's just say that together once because I want you to remember it when you leave here today. God, give me eyes full of compassion that lead me to action. Let me try that one more time. God, give me eyes of compassion that lead me to action. That's going to be my prayer for a while. And, and, and practically, you know, I'm not asking you guys to go ahead and get a crusade going. Maybe some of you, maybe some of you have got put in your heart to do that. Don't, don't let me stop you. But some of you say, might be feeling like, well, how can, I, how can I help? How can I get involved? How can I do this? The first thing you can do, in verse 37 of, of this, Jesus said to his disciples in chapter 9 that, let me turn my page, that the harvest was plentiful. So he's, and I don't think the harvest has really changed. I think the harvest is still plentiful these days. But the laborers are few. So the first thing we can do is we can see ourselves, not only as believers, but look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm a laborer. I'm a worker for Christ. And that doesn't mean you have to, it hasn't the sweat off, the sweat of your brow type, type work. For some of you, it will be. And I pray God give you the grace and the strength to do that. But for some of you, there's other ways. Intercession and prayer is a work. There has been no revival, no work, no major move of God 
that has ever happened that has been significant or impacting or effective that didn't begin with prayer. Evangelism, there's millions of dollars poured into evangelism year after year with little results because it's not, some of it is not upheld with prayer, it's upheld with programs. If the prayer is the thing that fuels the work of the kingdom. And, and so, leads me to the next thing you can do, you can say, I'm a laborer. The second thing you could do is say, I'm, I, I can pray. He said in the scriptures, it's not by might, not by power, but by the spirit. And so pray for divine appointments wherever you're at. And pray for the mailman come to your door and be like, God, help me to share with this man. Ask him, is there anything I can pray for you about? You know, um, there's 250,000 people, I think, or, or more in Orlando, if I'm, if I'm looking at it right. And there's 300 people here in this congregation and maybe 300 down the street. Still seems like a lot of people outnumber. So start praying laborers, you know, missionaries. God, bring missionaries to this area. Like the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, I commend you guys. You were a resource divinely appointed here that they could come and they could utilize your parking lot and utilize your love and your kindness so they could go out and they could minister. And, and there were souls won. Did you know that? There were souls won to the kingdom who, whose lives and eternities are changed because of your willingness to be faithful and provide resources to this building. That's a ministry. Jesus had a model that he carried through his ministry. His model was to teach, to preach, and to heal. So we talked about being a laborer. We talked about praying. If you want more practical things and you want to actually get out there and, and do it, he taught, he preached, he healed. And what that could look like is teaching. Just keep on meeting here. Learn the word of God. Because if we're making disciples, then we need to know how to teach the people what's right, what's truth. And we need to know for ourselves. So pray for your pastor. Pray for anybody sharing the word of God here because, because you want to be taught rightly so that you can turn and make disciples yourselves and teach them the word of truth correctly. Preaching seems more like evangelism to me. I mean, others might argue that it's, it's not entirely, but in a lot of in preaching the kingdom of heaven, which Jesus did, he was going out and he was preaching the kingdom of heaven is here. And so we carry the kingdom of heaven inside of us. We can go and we can preach, and we don't have to always preach with word. We can preach with kindness. You know, it says in the scriptures that, that God causes the sun, the sun to rise and to set and it to rain on both the good and the evil. There's those that don't know him. They're still breathing. They're still being provided for. And you know what? It's because God loves them. And so showing kindness, showing love is just one way. It might not get to a point where you lead somebody to Jesus Christ right there on the spot on a sidewalk. You might, but you might not. But the fact that you bless them is, is establishing God's kingdom here on earth. You know, yesterday we were at a park and we were walking around that park and that park, you know, there's people out there, there's families that are walking around, there's homeless there, there's people that are, you know, drug addicted, there's all kinds of stuff going on. You know, we just went around for a little while and we just gave out water and we gave out ice cream, you know, Pastor Jeff and his family and, and us and just wanted to bless people. We had the opportunity to pray with a man, whether that prayer landed with him, I'm not sure or not, but you know, there might be a point in time where, where he remembers that we prayed with him, that we cared just for a moment and just gave him a bottle of water. And when he's down in the dumps and he's thinking about who can I lean on, who can I trust, who can I rely on, he might just remember that a Christian person took the time to be invested and care about his life. So, so that's a practical way you could just get involved in doing stuff, even your neighbor. So, and I think the last point before we continue on with the music, guys, is... Um, you know, one of the revelations I feel that Jesus kind of gave me as I was reading through this was that a lot of times when I view those that are not in faith or in relationship with the Lord, I, I say a lot of times, yeah, they're, they're lost and dying, and that's true. But it seems to cloud some of, my, some of my view of that person because what Jesus sees, if, if God sees the end from the beginning, then that person that he wants to reach who's going to lay hold, who's going to grab hold of the truth of the gospel, Jesus already sees that person as a disciple. 
who's going to make a disciple and make another disciple. And that's how the laborers grow. That's how the, the work continues and grows and is blessed. So, so pray God to give you, give you the ability with sensitivity and, and, and soberness of mind to, to see them as lost and hurting. But man, that man might be a future disciple. That man might be the next Billy Graham. God, help me to see that. Help me to see that person that way. And so, thank you for letting me share this morning out of God's Word. I really hope it wasn't uh, too heavy-handed. I'll, I'll know whether I get an invitation back or not, whether or not it was. <laughs> Amen.